delighted to introduce our guest speaker for today, Gunnery Sergeant Evil, who will be sharing his experience as a military musician and recommendations for all of you. And we'll be talking about everything he's done and also how entrepreneurship fits into a military career in music. So very excited to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me as a guest today. It's uh, bad to be here. How come no one's dressed up like a trombone player? It's supposed to be scary on Halloween, right? Uh -huh. All the trombone players. Man. I'm a trombone player, so I'm loving folks. I know this is right before lunchtime, so these are the jokes. <laughs> Use of that right there. All right, so who's got the best trombone joke? Let's hear it. Damn. Best trombone joke. Okay, let's hear a tuba joke. What's the difference between a regular tuba player and a super tuba player? Regular tuba player and a super player. Super tuba player. I do not know. I am going to add that to my repertoire right here. That's a good one. <laughs> well, uh, maybe we'll have a chance to uh, see how uh, entrepreneurial we are with our humor later on. You know, get those out there. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and the, I'm not sure if, if how much familiar we have with life as a military musician. Probably in a crowd like this, some of you may have an, uh, a family member who's in the military or an extended family member or know someone in the military or at least, has anyone ever seen a military band anywhere? Sure, so at least maybe you've seen. So we have varied experience when we talk about military musicianship, but it is largely a mystery to a lot of people, to the general public, and even to the general public of musicians out there studying in undergraduate or graduate studies and, and organizations. So I want to tell you a little bit about life as a military musician. I also want to, I was very intrigued by the class of uh, an entrepreneurial music class. I think that is a wonderful idea because that's, that's the kind way, that's the really the, the, I guess that's the academic way of saying hustle, right? <laughs> I mean, musicians have to have the hustle. You know, and some musicians have it, and some don't, right? You know, those musicians, and you've all seen these guys. They're out there, they may not be the best uh, guys on, the, on their horn, but they're out there getting gigs, and they got the promos, they got the demo tapes, they got all this stuff, they got the website, they got everything. It was like, this guy can't even play his way out of a paper bag, and he's like getting all these gigs, and I'm sitting here shedding all that long, and all of a sudden, why can't, because you don't have the hustle. That's right, so I thought it was really interesting about this uh, the entrepreneurial aspect of this. And yes, believe it or not, even in the military, when you think of military, you think of, you know, the straight, you know, clean cut, and even before I put my, I'm up this, this morning, or before sun's up, and I'm ironing my uniform so that it would last the trip up here, and I, I made sure I went down, and if there's any little, oh, there's one I missed, a little red string. I made sure these things are sharp. Oh, that hurt, you know, make sure everything's, you know, ready to go. Make sure I have the same color socks. Yes, I do. That's good. <laughs> make sure everything's there. Funny story, I had a guy one time in a band, we were at a gig, and my, one of my trumpet players in the big band I was leading in the military, and he's over there changing in the far side of the change room. I'm like, what's going on? Why are you over here? He's like, ah, oh, just change over here. And so then I see him over here with edge dressing. You know what edge dressing is? It's that, it's, it's like that stuff you put up, you, you paint your shoes, the, the, the sole of your shoe black. So it's just like a little black can of paint that you put on your shoes. He's over there painting his ankles black because he forgot his socks. Oh. <laughs> so say, in the military you think they gotta go to whatever it takes to get in uniform, you're gonna do it, right? But believe it or not, as a military musician, there is a level of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship to a degree that we, even employing the, the ideas and the concepts of how to be a better entre entrepreneur and how to market yourself and to better yourself, even as a military musician. So I think that's really universal for all musicians, right? And you guys know, uh, as, as musicians, as performing artists, you know, it doesn't really matter who you studied with or where you studied or how many degrees you have or whatever else. You're only as good as the last note you play, right? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? And so how are you marketing that note? How are you marketing yourself and everything? So first of all, uh, I always like to begin, I do a lot of, I teach a lot of career classes and talk to people about um, 
life as a military musician and, and, and making a career in music. And the first thing I always say is, who wants to make a living making music? You know, just raise your hand. You, you, I mean, you don't have to, but if you do, you want to make a living making music, right? And when I say make a living, what do I mean make a living? What does it mean to make a living? Get paid. Get paid, right? <laughs> Put food on the table, right? To be able to buy that mouthpiece or to be able to buy that car or like, or, or when you have kids, like I have two children right now, and so my son's playing trumpet, no problem. I had a trumpet, cost like, what, 10 bucks at a pawn shop, no problem, okay? My <laughs> daughter, playing harp. Why couldn't she play trombone or something? You know, when I could get, people are trying to give me trombones, you know? Not a harp, people, so like, we gotta get gigs to pay for these harps, right? Like a car. So, but yes, to make your living, making music, you wanna do that, right? How many people would consider yourself, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people would consider yourself passionate about music? All right, do you consider yourself passionate about music? See, you can tell who's passionate. You're like, <laughs> make your hands go right up. So I always start my class by saying, if you want to make a living making music, and you are passionate about your art, then you will have a rewarding career, okay? You will have a rewarding career. Those two elements, that, that's really the key ingredients to doing that. You have the desire and you have the passion to do it. You're going to find that way to do it. Now, notice, I did not say you will have a lucrative career, right? <laughs> I didn't say you're going to have a trouble-free career or whatever. It doesn't matter. And that's regardless of which way you go. And this is why these concepts of entrepreneurship and everything are important. Because they're going to help along that way. You're going to be, you're, it's going to be rewarding. But it just depends on to what degree and what your goals are along the way. So you're going to have a rewarding career, but you're going to face struggles as a musician, are you not? And you know, as well as I do, there is no worthwhile life or work or endeavor or anything that is possible without some measure of sacrifice or discipline, right? You know that because you're here studying one of the top tier schools of music in the country. And you didn't get here because you took that trombone and put it on your pillow at night. I mean, you can try this if you want to, but I've, I've done this. If, if you put the trombone on your pillow at night, the only thing you wake up, you don't wake up playing like J.J. Johnson, you know, you are Joe Alessi, you wake up with a headache. That's all you wake up with, right? <laughs> Actually, you can sleep with a, tr a trombone under your pillow at night. You just have to put just the slide there. Mm. And then you'll have dreams of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> See, when you take off the bells, that's just... Okay, we're going to move on now with the body of the work. All right, folks, let's get used to it here. See? You gotta help me there. You gotta help me with these, these trombone jokes. So, first of all, uh, life as a military musician. And, and oh, and by the way, as we go through our presentation today, I encourage you, we only have a short amount of time. If there's something that you would like me, he's like, here's a guy in uniform with a bad haircut. Hey, I wanna ask him something, all right? Let me find out what. I want you to write down your question and make sure if I don't address the question, it could be anything, anything about music, anything about the military, uh, anything about my experience, I'd be happy to, to, I'll do my best to give you an answer or direct you in the, in the right direction. Um, but please get those questions ready and, and at any time during the presentation, I could be in the middle of one thought and just raise your hand up. I was doing this last week at the University of Arizona and I had a, uh, a, one of the gentlemen in the class, I had asked, I had played a song in the beginning of the class and I'd asked, does anyone know what that song was? And no one recognized it at first. About 15 minutes into the presentation, one of the trombone players raised his hand. I was like, oh, he's going to ask a question. It's like, I know who wrote that song. It was Henry Mancini. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was like, totally threw me off. I was like, wait a minute. But at any time, you can, you can throw up uh, the question, and I'll do my best to answer it, okay? So very informal here. Uh, you know, no, don't worry about uh, interrupting my train of thought or whatever. You won't worry about that. So, as a military musician, some people think, okay, you're in the military, but what, what you're a musician, is that just your side job in the military, but you're actually in the military, or what? There's a lot of mystery about that. And of course, we have different branches, you know, uh, of the military, we each have a music program, and so they vary from some one degree to another, and I have some familiarity with my uh, brothers and sisters in, in the other services. I spent a few years in the Army National Guard Band, I also uh, worked closely at the Naval School of Music the last eight years with uh, my friends in the Navy and my friends in the Army. And I've toured with se uh, several different uh, Air Force organizations as a guest. And I've had some friends when I was uh, stationed in Hawaii. Well, I used to do a lot of gigs with my 
friends in the Air Force Band there. So I have some familiar, familiarity with their programs, but primarily I, I am the resident expert on the Marine Music Program, but I can answer in general some of the other questions if you might have about some of the other branches. Regardless, in the military we have what's called a military occupational specialty. And so that we call it MOS. The military loves acronyms, right? So we have um, our MOS, our occupational specialty. So for me, that is musician. Other people, it might be information technology, computer programmer or something. It might be a supply person. It might be someone who is a mechanic or who works on, uh, in avionics or uh, radio or communications. or That's their job in the military. So my job in the military is a musician. So I have to fulfill the requirements that uh, military service obligates me to. In other words, I have to maintain a certain appearance standard. I have to maintain certain physical fitness standards. I have to do certain annual training every year. Like in the Marines, we, we, the Marines are every, there's a saying, every Marine a rifleman. So every Marine, no matter what your job, they go and qualify on the uh, service rifle every year for a week and they get their qualification to make sure that they're still qualified. Other services have different qualifications that they have to do. Like if you're in the Navy, you're going to be trained how to put out a fire on a ship. And everyone's got a job on the ship how to put out a fire and to react in an emergency situation on a ship. And that's just training that you're going to do. You have to do. Um, but the main job is as a musician. So like everybody else, we have time. We make time to practice. We even put in our plans of the day, we put this, from this hour to this hour is set aside for you to individually practice. From this hour to this hour, you're going to do this, uh, this ensemble. So you might have wind ensemble here. You might be in the brass quintet. You might have be in the jazz combo. You're rehearsing. And then we have some administrative work to do, just like you have things that you gotta keep up with. You gotta balance your checkbook, you know? You ate too much pizza last week, okay? Trombone players, you delivered too much pizza, right? <laughs> so, got it. All right, so. You have to balance your books and all this stuff. So we have things like that in our, in our organizations that we do, some administration work that we have to take care of. And then, what's the other part of it? The gigs, right? <laughs> we do a lot of gigs. We go perform. So we're, maybe we're on the road. Maybe we're up in New York for Fleet Week, or maybe we're playing at the Super Bowl, or maybe we're playing uh, in a foreign country somewhere, or doing something else, uh, something, you know, some other type of, of community relations concerts, or we might be on a recruiting tour, or we may be doing a ceremonial function, we may be playing for the general who's changing command with this general, or this sergeant major who's changing command with this sergeant, uh, or who's, who's turning over with this <coughs> sergeant major, uh, post and relief we call it. So there may be a ceremony, we may be doing the, a color, does anyone know what a color ceremony is? What, what's a color ceremony? It's, uh, here. Here's the um, just raising the door. Absolutely. So no matter where you are, so let's say you go down to, to San Antonio and you go to Sam, Sam Houston, the, the fort there. Let's say you go to uh, Virginia and go to Quantico Marine Base. Or let's say you go to San Diego at the Navy, Navy Base. Or let's say you go to, to Italy at the Navy, Na Naples and the, at the Naval uh, uh, group over there. Or let's say you go um, anywhere, Langley Air Force Base or anywhere else, Lackland. At 8 o'clock in the morning, you know what's going to happen. You're going to hear five minutes before 8, the trumpet's going to sound first call over the speakers. And then at 8 o'clock, they're going to have a color ceremony. Sometimes they bring a band out. The band comes out 15, 20 minutes before, does a concert. And then at 8 o'clock, the flag goes up and they do the national anthem. And the whole base stops. And we all stop. And cars stop driving. And people, if you're out, you, you stand and salute toward the music or toward the flag if you can see it. And you might hear, and hear the band playing the national anthem. Now, obviously not a band on every base doing that. Thanks to the wonder of modern digital recording technology, you know, that's broadcast over the speakers. But these are the types of gigs that are going to happen. So we have a lot of gigs. So you guys, who wants to be a professional performing musician? Make your living performing music. <coughs> so a handful of people, okay. So we've got a handful of people who want to make money making music. That means gigs, right? So ask yourself, how many gigs did I do last year? There's some people who want to be professional performing musicians, but they only put the tux on and got on the stage maybe five times last year, right? Or maybe 10 times or whatever it is. 
How many gigs do you think you need to, to do to make a living making music? Or how many gigs, let's not put it that way. How many gigs would you like to play every year? Those who raise your hand, tell me, like, how many gigs do you think you'd be comfortable playing a year? Someone who raised their hand. Um, 150. 150, 100 to 150. Anybody else agree with that? Less, more? Like four or five a week. Four or five a week? Okay. So how many, of that, how many is that a year? Oh, I see the smoke rising right now. <laughs> how many... All the trombone players are like, how many weeks in a year? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, trombone players. So, yeah, what, so, uh, you know, so four to five, four to five a, a week. Anybody else? I'm surprised in the entrepreneur class, they don't say, I'm going to make a living doing 10 gigs a year, man. Because <laughs> you know? I'm marketing myself. I can pick and choose my gigs, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was a trick question, right? So. Well, in a military ensemble, you certainly get the performing experience. Absolutely. You get that performing experience right away. And so we do a lot of gigs. So that's definitely a part of our lives. Uh, now, I might, I might not play on every gig, but an ensemble may have upwards of 350 gigs a year, 300 gigs a year, 250 gigs a year. Wow. Now, that may not be every ensemble. So that, that may be, that's including all the brass quintet gigs, all the woodwind quintet gigs. All the trombone quartet gigs, if they have one that went out. The ceremonial band gigs, if they have a big band, if they have a jazz combo, if they have a brass band. If they have, dare I say, an oboe trio. <laughs> no, that's our secret weapon. They only go on special missions. Okay? <laughs> when, we, when someone gets out of line over there, you don't hear about those gigs. But you know what? When that dictator goes down somewhere across the world, you know the oboe trio has been there, okay? <laughs> you know it has happened. You never hear about it, but in the... You could be in the White House briefing room, you'd know when the president says, bring up the black sticks of death. <laughs> Boom, I'm just kidding. Any oboe players in the house, by the way? I am so sorry. About <laughs> I love the oboe sticks. In any case, uh, we have uh, you know, all kinds of different ensembles and combined. So just like here at the university, does anyone know any of your uh, uh, trivia geeks in here. How many concerts does the University of North Texas College of Music do every year? Yes, sir. Over a thousand, right? And I did my undergraduate at Indiana University, and we had some uh, like a similar number. It was like there was always something happening. I mean, you could go hear any kind of music, any kind of instrument, and we were encouraged to do so, just as you probably are. And it really broadens your world. See, but you don't play in all those gigs, right? So the same thing in the military ensemble. We may have the large ensemble, but then out of, that, out of that larger wind ensemble or so, we have all these other groups that do gigs, from solo piano gigs all the way up to the larger groups. So that, in a nutshell, is the type of lifestyle that we have. Now, um, has anyone ever heard the term liberty? I don't know if you've heard the word, but as it applies to a military person, what does it mean if I go on liberty? Yes, sir. Means I'm off duty. That is correct. You may have some. Do you have formal military service? I do. There you go. <laughs> so you have a class resident expert right here. So we say, if I'm on liberty, or for short, we say libo. If I'm on libo, liberty, after my work day is done, guess what my time is? My time. So when I was working as a musician in Hawaii, and, and I lived in Hawaii four years in the Marine Band there, or when I was a musician at Quantico Marine Band, or at the Naval School of Music, at the end of my day, I just spent eight years in Virginia Beach, so at the end of my day, when I'm done teaching, when I go home, I'm with my family, and it's my time, or I can work as a gig. So I got to play sometimes with uh, Virginia Symphony Pops, or we had a Virginia Symphony Jazz Orchestra, and we had and other gigs, some casual jazz gigs here, so I might do a wedding gig here, or I might do, you know, a polka gig over here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would do, I'm a, no, actually I'm a trombone player, I'll take whatever gig you give me. So. Um, <laughs> So whatever, you know, that was my time. And as long as it did not do anything that would uh, reflect uh, badly on my position as a member of the United States Marine Corps, or as long as it didn't do, uh, you know, wasn't any, any kind of illegal activity or whatever, of course, then I was, you're free to work as a musician in some other capacity. So I did many civilian gigs, but you're a Marine 24 hours a day, but I did many civilian gigs. And so, of course, all the same rules that apply to anyone else trying to get a gig as an entrepreneur, right, apply to me in those, in those circumstances as well. So 
this is kind of a, a, a snapshot picture of the kind of life that a military musician will have. You have your military obligations and responsibilities, and those do come first. So anytime I took a gig outside, I would always have to give the contractor a caveat and say, okay, here's, uh, yes, I can do that gig. However, in case something comes up, now in most cases you know it's very, it is rare that something would come at last minute and you'd have to do that. But, but you still have to do that because if something did come up, your military obligation obviously comes first. I can only think of one time in my, in, in 20 years of service as a military musician that that actually ever happened. But, regardless, that's part of my experience as a military musician. Now let me, you ask me some questions. What, 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 what can I flesh out more about some of that general information about life as a military musician that you'd like to know? What's life like when this, or what is this like? Any questions at all? None. Yes, sir. Do you find travel balancing time between your family, work, music, other aspects? The question is, do I find time, uh, trouble balancing, you know, the different aspects of my life, family, work, the, the military gig, whatever else? Well, I can turn that question back around to you. As a musician, how do you manage your time? How much are you practicing a day? You know? Would you like to practice more? <laughs> Would you like to do something else more? Uh, in fact, don't, add, don't raise your hands, but ask yourself, how much am I, am I practicing right now? Am I practicing two hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day? Whatever the number is, what if I told you, hypothetically, which means this isn't going to happen, but hypothetically, what if I told you I was going to give you $25,000 if for the next month you would add an hour and a half practice a day to your routine? How many think, by show of hands, how many think you could do that? for the next month. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so what you're telling me is with you guys, with mu you, you musicians, it's really all about the money. Right? <laughs> That's a joke, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but really, think about it. Isn't that interesting if we say, well, we're doing this right now, we're probably doing the best we can right now, but if I said this, I was gonna give you this, that would motivate you, right? And you would say, yeah, I would be motivated for $25,000 to find a way. So what you have to ask yourself is, how can I find that same motivation without someone giving me $25,000? Because wouldn't the end result be pretty cool if you could add that extra practice time? Remember how we said about whatever in life, there's nothing worthwhile that comes without a cost? So to answer your question, I would say, I have to make choices. Mm -hmm. I have to make choices. You as an artist, as musicians, you make choices every day. I'm teaching this to my children. When my son last night, he's practicing his trumpet, and he wants to get, last week was the first week he practiced 500 minutes in a week. That was his goal, and he did it. Why? Because he chose. He chose to do it. I did not force him to do it. He chose to do it. He filled in his practice record. He made choices. So he didn't throw the football as much, or he didn't do whatever as much, and he's learning those lessons that for musicians, for artists, and for any worthwhile endeavor in life, it's about the choices that you make. And so, what, what always comes with a choice? What always follows a choice? A consequence. Yes, sir. A consequence. A consequence. Now, let me ask you, is a consequence good or bad? Both. It depends. It depends. Typically, we think of, oh, you're gonna suffer the consequences, right? <laughs> we think of consequences as something punitive or bad. However, consequences can be good or bad. And I use the illustration like this. If you brush your teeth this morning, which I hope we all did, but if you brush your teeth this morning, you squeeze a little bit too much toothpaste out of the tube, guess what? You are not putting that toothpaste back in, <laughs> right? If you chose to squeeze too much out, for whatever reason, you're not getting it back in. And that's kind of like consequences, right? And choices that we make. So if you choose, instead of practicing tonight, if you choose to go out and eat deep dish pizza and watch the game or do whatever else or have your social life or, or whatever you have. You guys have the world at your fingertips. I'm going to show you my phone here. That's a government phone. It's a government phone. Get ready. No, this is my phone. I, I got a government smartphone. <laughs> Let me show y'all something cool right here. <laughs> yeah. That's what, what we're talking about. This thing works, okay? Hey, you got the world at your fingertips. And you know, I'm going to Google this. I'm going to play this. I'm going to do this. I mean, what was that craze they were doing a few like a couple years ago when they were like walking around finding this thing. You Pokemon know? Go. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is like, I would see guys out, you know, they're like walking around, you know, just aimlessly walking in the park. 
We used to see that in you know, generations before, but for other reasons. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you make the choice. And the consequence of that choice is, you had a great time with your friends, you had great pizza, but the consequence is, you lost $12.95. And for a college student, that's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah. And you didn't get to work on that Sonatina. You didn't get to work on that Clifford Brown transcription. You didn't get to work on that website you're trying to build for yourself. You didn't do that arrangement that you know that if you play this for this concert coming up, that that contractor's gonna hear you. Whatever the consequence is. Now, think about this. How do I balance that time? I have to ask myself a question. And this would be, we would all do well to do this. Think of everything you did yesterday, okay? I want you to think of everything you did yesterday. What you studied, what you practiced, what you did for leisure, whatever else. For 24 hours, I'm including the whole 24 hours. Ask yourself what I did yesterday and then reflect on it because guess what? You traded a day of your life for that. That's your most precious commodity. And you traded a day of your life for whatever you did. And remember, nobody makes you do anything. Well, yeah, if I don't, if I don't go to class, Dr. Clare, she's going to come knock me out, man. I mean, she's, she's got thugs, man. She's going to come and get... No, 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 no. She's not making you do anything. You're doing it because of your choices, right? Now, there may be heavy penalties to pay if you don't do something that you're asked, especially when we can talk about the law and everything else. But still, you're choosing to do it. And if you trade, if I trade a day of my life for everything, so when I go home at night, I typically, unless my kids are practicing and my wife has been something, I typically don't practice at night anymore. That's family time. So I say, here's my choice. Okay, I guess, and you can read the lives of great musicians who have practiced so much, but what was the cost of their family? Mm -hmm. You know? Hey, that's, I'm not, if, if, they, if you have the drive and desire to do that, Okay, fine, but you have to weigh the cost and count the cost. And that's how I balance, I try my best to balance that. But because I did that, when I was living at Quantico, in, in the Quantico band, we lived about 35 miles away. I got up at four o'clock every morning. I left my house at 4.30 every morning and for four years. And I got to work about 5.15, so I didn't have to deal with any traffic up there. And I practiced from about 5.30 to 7.30 when our day kind of began. Two, I had, that was my two hours. And then I had an hour and a half for lunch sometimes. I would practice another hour then. And then throughout the day we had designated practice time and so I would do that. So I would get my four plus hours in if I could like that with no cost to my family and no cost to my other duties. But it comes at a cost, right? You have to weigh and make those decisions as a musician. Any other questions? I won't try to answer as long, but I thought that was a good question and I question. needed a thorough yeah, answer. Yeah. What else? Questions you have about life as a military musician? <coughs> Can you share with us a little bit about what we were saying in terms of how entrepreneurship plays a role in promotion Absolutely. in the military? Well, I don't have time to go into the whole sch schematic about how we get promoted, but it is very different that we get promoted and advanced quite differently than like um, a, a corporation might do it. There's some things that are similar, but some that's different. It would, it would probably surprise you how it actually happens, how you get from this rank, how you get many more stripes on your sleeve. Some of it has to do with budget and how many openings there are. Some of it has to do with, uh, with how much time you have and how much you, we have evaluations that we're given and they're run up the chain of command and the superiors sign off on your evaluation. So one man writes my, my report and he, whatever that evaluation is, that gets briefed before a board of people who aren't in my occupational specialty, who aren't musicians. And so they see my record, and there's a lot of things that factor into that. There's, there's things like my physical fitness score, test scores. I have to take two physical fitness tests a year. Those scores go on there. My skills as a communicator, my skills as uh, in my job, my skills as a musician. Uh, it has to do with my, I have to submit a photo for my promotion. So I have to have a photo like this, we have to submit a photo like this, and it shows how we wear the uniform. Are there, is my uniform square weight? Do I look, do I fit our height weight standards? Do I look um, like a United States Marine? You know, the, all these things go into part of how you bring promoted. Now can you imagine if you, you were gonna get promoted and they said, oh yeah, I need a, I need a photograph of you. All right, I want a photograph of you. 
in your, uh, in your, in your tuxedo. <laughs> oh no, there's a string hanging off your right arm. Forget it. I don't care how you play, you know, forget. It's not that, that, that bad, but I'm just saying that's part of a small part of a bigger picture. And there's other factors as well. So you may think with such a rigid kind of thing, how do you, what can be an entrepreneur? Well, I have to better myself. I have to make sure that I know and I have to balance my time and to get all those, those things right. But also, and for each one of these skills that we're evaluated on, like communication and effectiveness as a team player and things like that, I have to find ways to get better at those and to better myself so that I am not just doing a duty that I'm being asked, but so that I become someone that they rely on, right? And I market myself. So let's say I'm that trumpet player in the band. And, the, and let's say I'm in a band that has um, a wind ensemble and I'm a great trumpet player. You put the Haydn in front of me and I'm just like, you put a Charlier or a Brandt in front of me, I think it's going to tear it up, man. Or I can do a transfer or whatever. But let's say that we also in the band, we have, uh, I'm playing in brass quintet and I'm playing in wind ensemble. But I also have to market myself as, I want to market myself as an improviser as well. I don't have a lot of commercial experience. So I need to start building those skills, first of all, to be an entrepreneur, you can have all the business skills in the world, but you do have to have a product, right? You've got to have, you've got to back up. I can say all the talk I want to about my product, but until they see the product, if the product's terrible. So you've got to work on the skills to get the product, but then I also have to know how to use those skills in my organization to better myself and make myself more marketable to my leadership. <coughs> and we all do this, right? You want to be known, you, know, you want the conductor or, your, or the personnel manager or whomever else. Yes, you may be fulfilling a very small role in the orchestra or whatever else, but you want to be known as that person who can, yes, we don't have to hire another lead player for the Pops concert because this guy can do it, you know? We don't have to do this because they can do that. Oh, not only is he, the great, is he great in his part in the orchestra, but he also has these other skills that add value to the organization. So he, whether that's, you know, you have a skill as a photographer or you have a skill as whatever else and you can add value to the organization and you may or may not be getting paid for it, but you're adding value to them and in a way that by, by showing your product and doing it well and doing it with the right attitude, you're marketing yourself and you make yourself more marketable in that organization. And that helps you have a better footing when it comes to your promotion or your advancement in any career because you've, you've, you've become, in the military we call, we call something, there's something we call a force multiplier. Mm. So it has kind of a combat uh, analogy to it. So if you have tanks over here and helicopters over here and the SEAL team over here, and whatever, I'm just being, you know, in general. This, but all these things that can do different roles, it's like a force multiplier that helps attack from all kinds of different angles to get the best result and, and to gain the victory. You want to gain victory as a musician, as an artist. We want to have a victory at, in, our, in, in a sense in our position. And so to do that, I have to learn how to uh, market myself and make myself a better asset for the organization. Now, a word of caution with that. A lot of times we talk about these type of things and we get going and, we, and I always go back to this. I wanna make sure that, at least from my, my, per, my perspective to you, when, when I do these things and when you do these things, make sure you have the right motive in, in heart, okay? You can say, well, I'm gonna do this because that's gonna make them do this. Now that's okay, knowing what motivates your organization, knowing what motivates your leadership, knowing what motivates everything else. It's okay to do those things, but make sure your motives are right, that you're doing them for the true, for, for, for right motives, okay? It's not just to gain something. I like to think of it, I want to add value, regardless of whether or not it does something for me, because that's not up to me, right? Whose decisions are you responsible for? <laughs> you're responsible for your decisions, right? Now you can make decisions and you can do the things that may put you in that better standing or give you the opportunity, but that doesn't mean that the opportunity is going to come. And if it doesn't come, then you have to ask yourself. Sometimes I would ask my students this. I would say, listen, let me ask you this. What if you knew right now, and say what, how, who do we have here? Do we have, how many graduate students are here? 
Couple graduate students. How many? Uh, any any under is any, any undergraduates here? Any freshmen here? Sophomores, juniors, seniors. So all seniors. Okay. A couple juniors, seniors. Okay. Let me ask you this: If you're a senior, <coughs> now let's go back. Let's say if you're if you're a junior, what if I told you right now? No matter what, you know I can see the future. I can't, but let's say I can see, and you're not going to get a degree from UNT. You're not going to graduate. Your professors, for whatever reason, are not going to pass your final recital. You're not going to, or let's say you're, 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 you're a grad student. Guess what? You can, uh, what if I told you right now they're not going to approve your dissertation? Or they're not, when you go to defend your dissertation, they're not going to, you're not going to get the DMA. What if I told you that, would you keep practicing? Yes. Would you keep, thank you, would you keep studying and working even if you knew? that they were not going to allow you to get the degree or if you weren't going to get the job or the chair or the position, what's motivating you? Would you continue to work hard, sacrifice, strive if you knew it wasn't going to result in monetary compensation or whatever else? Now, I don't want to get too you know, altruistic and everything about, about, yeah, obviously those are real things and you have to take those into consideration, that's true. But make sure when you're doing something to market yourself and promote yourself and push yourself in your organization and get yourself in the right standing in the eyes of your leadership or your teachers or whoever else, make sure that you have the right motives. Because we've all been around people who are doing something just to get something else, right? Sometimes for me, I like to think, if you look on my identification card, it says I'm in the uniform services. So I'm in the armed service. Sometimes I'll be out, uh, if, if I'm out in the mall or out somewhere else, I usually don't go to the mall dressed like this. I usually don't go to the mall anyway. But if, if I'm out somewhere dressed like this, someone might come up to me and say, hey, thank you for your service. Now, I reflected on that over the years. What does it mean, why do we call what I do in the service? Who am I serving? Why do we call our armed why don't we call it just the armed forces? Why don't we call it the armed services? Anybody? Any ideas? Who are the armed services serving? The American people. The American people? Yeah. Anybody else? What else? Government. Serving the government? Okay, perhaps. What, what else? What other ideas? Special interests. Special interest groups, <laughs> perhaps? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, this is interesting seeing everyone's perspective on service. Have you guys gone to a restaurant or uh, going to a business this week and you were like, I'm not tipping 20%. <laughs> I'm going to tip 5%. Why did you tip 5% instead of 20%? Because of the service, service you received. Think about service and what it means. In my case, I do think about who am I serving. And for me, it's a great privilege because I am serving my country. I'm serving the ideals of this country, I'm serving the ideals of the Constitution. When you join the military, you raise your right hand and say, I'm going to, to, to protect and defend, but also serve the ideals on which our way of life is built on. We can have all kinds of different political views and everything else, but we're all benefiting from a, from a particular way of life that I think is beautiful. The fact that you can come here and study music and get a degree in music my dad was an engineer. When I told him I was going to get a degree in music and I wanted to study music, he was like, what? <laughs> you going to put bread on the table doing what? <laughs> but you know what? Bless his heart. He supported me 100%. He, couldn't, he was not a musician, but he would sing his heart out. And he supported that because, and he said, son, if you're going to be a music major, then you're going to do it 100%. You're going to give it everything you got. You're going to make the choices to do that 100% and you're going to make it. And so I appreciate that. So anyway, I don't want to get you know, too, too much in, into that, but I do want to say that service is a big part of what I think of. I am serving, when I put my horn in my face, that's remarkable to me. I, I sometimes have to shake my, my, pinch myself and say, I'm serving my country by uh, developing my art and sharing my art in these different, these different ways. And you really, as an artist, who are you serving as just an artist? If you're trying to become a better artist, who, do, who does the artistic community serve? <laughs> hmm? 
Mm, that's interesting, huh? That's the big question, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> am I serving Aki Joker up front? Or am I serving the organization? Am I serving the board of directors of the orchestra? Am I serving special interests? <laughs> am I serving, you know, these trumpet players? Man, that, that's a special interest group right there. You know, I'm telling you what, trumpet, no, I'm just kidding. And who am I serving? Or do you think service is part of, a, of artistic development? Well, then you better ask yourself, who to whom am I serving? Or, or what am I a servant to? Being a servant is not bad. I choose to serve. I didn't, I wasn't drafted. In fact, I got off of active duty and I came back. I was in the reserves and I came back active duty. And I came back active duty after I was deployed overseas. And I didn't go with a band. I, I did not deploy I, uh, on my, I had a, a combat deployment, but it was not with a band. It was with an, another, another part of the military. Uh, civil Affairs Group attached to an infantry battalion. But I, I was not in a, in a, 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 a musician when I deployed. However, I came back active duty even after that experience, which was remarkably rewarding in itself. And I don't have time to share that with you, but it's volunteer. So when you say you were deployed, you chose to be deployed in combat? Or is it... Or so like if you join as a musician, are you always going to be a musician or is there a chance You'll always be a musician. However, to... any branch of service, if you, you're signing the dotted line to serve your country in that capacity. So if the, if, if it, you know, now I'll promise you, if the oboe player is going out there with a the black <laughs> stick of death, then they're probably coming over the county line, you know, okay. if all the oboe players and all the military branches. However, Marines have, I can speak for Marines, Marines have deployed as bands. Mm -hmm. But their role is not, they have a secondary mission as deployment. They would take their instruments and they would, they would play perhaps morale concerts or something, but they were also uh, rear area security, so they may, they may serve as, uh, at the headquarters compound and, and helping secure the compound and that type of thing. But still wasn't, like, it wasn't like on the front lines, it wasn't in combat, was it? No, not necessarily. Okay. However, it, it the, could happen. The front lines anymore is a different thing because well, there were sure, Marines who were stationed at, at the in the Ford Operating Base, and let's say mm -hmm. someone came and lobbed something over the base. Well, that technically, if someone's firing some projectile over the sure. wall, that could be considered combat, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't say that, but yes, they're not the infantry, but they are. They were in that role. However, that is not typical. I've known most Marines. Uh, many musician marines, 20 plus years, never even deployed at once. Mm. It just depends on what's happening. In that time, 10 years or so ago, there was a lot of deployments, you know, yeah. that were happening. However, uh, my point is, you know, uh, different services have different responsibilities. And, but uh, as I said in the beginning, your main job is as a musician. But I would never say, no, you're never going to be deployed mm -hmm. because your service, your mm -hmm. servant. You are serving your country. You're serving the ideals and everything else. And if that, if it deems that that, that, that you're needed in some other capacity, then you have to be willing. That's a volunteer. Mm -hmm. So if you volunteer, so now when I was deployed, I would volunteer with another organization. And that organization just ended up being called up. It was a reserve organization, but it ended up being called up to active duty. But you know what? And that maybe that's for another time. But I had some great musical experiences. In that time, one of my interpreters, just very briefly, one of my interpreters in Iraq was from Mosul, and he was a clarinet player. Yeah. And his dad had started a wind band in Mosul, Iraq, in I guess it was the late 70s or so. And he showed me pictures. And any time, every time, all of our off time, I didn't play my whole deployment, but in all of our off time, he was always, we were always talking about music. It was remarkable to me. And, the, and it was the strangest circumstance. You're in the desert and all this other stuff, and we're talking about Eddie Daniels and Woody Herman and you know all these great music jazz musicians through the years, and just talking about music and art pervades even the most dire circumstances in life. It's just it's really neat. And I was able to serve him, and he served me because here in an, an environment where I had really no artistic outlet, all of a sudden. Like a, like a ray of sun through a dark sky, he came and, and we talked about music all the time. I was like, this is cool, man. I'm like going to the music school, learning about stuff, and we're bouncing musical ideas off each other's head, and so music. He was marketing himself, too. He was like, he was like 
listen, I want to show you some demo tapes I did. He had worked in Jordan for a while, and even the entrepreneurial aspect, he was like, I want to, listen, how can I, when, I, when this is over, how can I get and do this and study here and do that thing? And I was like, okay, here's what you need to work on. Here's what you need, everybody. He wanted to hustle. He had to hustle, you know. <laughs> Can you tell us about the auditions that are going to happen next month? Yes, uh, we have every branch has different audition processes, but our auditions are, are similar to other auditions. Um, if you go to musicalchairs.info and one day on the musical chairs to find a gig, right, sure. If you, you search uh, clarinet vacancies or trumpet vacancies or French horn vacancies or flute vacancies right now, you'll find some listings that Marine Music has. And we have uh, PDFs, we have our excerpts on there, we have some excerpts that you would have to perform, and then the half of our audition is sight reading. So it's prepared excerpts like any other audition and sight reading. And we have, those are what we call planned regional auditions. And so they're listed on the, on the web. I have posters up, different places. You may have seen them places. And so people can, you have to send me a resume and that type of thing like anywhere else. And we have certain vacancies available. And you have to meet the qualifications for a musician. And then you have to, beyond that, meet the qualifications of being in the United States military. So I had a uh, trumpet player. Actually, since it's on musical chairs, I've had a lot of international. <laughs> so I had a trumpet player from uh, uh, Russia email me last week. You know, He's like, yes, I'm this. I'm like, well, first of all, as a, you have to be a green card holder. You have to be whatever else. But how old are you? I'm 47. Well, that's past the cutoff for our age. So, you know, you have to meet the certain age criteria and everything else. Okay. So we hold regional auditions like that. However, if someone just out of the blue comes in and they want to audition, they can contact me or they can contact, sometimes they'll go to the recruiter's office and say, I want to be in, in the band program, whatever. And they would get you in touch with me. And then I would, we don't audition anybody if they're not open. For musical chairs, you have to send a resume and I invite you, but for other individual auditions, someone would have to send a resume, and then they would have to send me a recording of some of the excerpts that we have, and then I would screen those, and then I would invite you to an audition. So. Could you give us a, a ballpark of what the salary ranges look like in a military career, what the starting salary yeah. is, and the benefits, and like all of that? And you can Google all this stuff, and you guys can look at my rank as an E7 in the United States Marine Corps, E7 with dependents, with over, tw with over 18 years, 20 years service. You can know what I, I make right now. Mm -hmm. But I would tell you, my, uh, the base pay, our starting pay, is around $40,000. You know, it just depends on how many dependents the person may have, or if, you have a, if you're married or not, or whatever. So it may be less than that, it may be slightly more, you, because, and that includes housing allowance for those with dependents. So if, if you're a single person, it'd probably be a little bit less than that. But you can look up the, the salaries, all of the military pay tables. So you have a base pay, and then you have a housing allowance. So I have a base pay, and then I get a housing allowance. So with my wife and two children, so my base pay is over $75,000 a year, and then my housing allowance is something like $16,000, $18,000 a year in this, in this zip code where I live in Fort Worth. And we just closed on a house yesterday, so we're going to be moving into that. So we've been living in an RV, so I've had harp on this <laughs> side of the RV and trumpet on this side of the RV and trombone in the middle, and my wife is coming at me. And then, uh, <laughs> but, but, and then we have a once a year clothing allowance, once a year we have a basic allowance for subsistence. And then in my job as a, as a music recruiter, if you will, she'll duty pay, which is a, about $350 extra a month. So all the pay is there for you to see. You can look up every, we wear our rank on our sleeve and our pay's online and everywhere I've been and all my accolades are right here on my chest. So everything about me is laid open, right? You know, But that's okay, you can find out everything about the pay. Then you can Google the average uh, median pay for a musician, a music teacher, or a music performer. Now, nationwide, most, most majors, probably about 25% of people get a job in their chosen field. For music, a couple years ago at Indiana University, one of the music education professors did a study, and they showed for musicians it's a little bit better, and for music ed majors it's a little bit better than that. Over 50% of music ed, ed majors will get a job <coughs> in their field. However, most music ed majors stop teaching after five years yeah. of teaching. And I would tell you, my first job was as a, as a musician. I was on the road for a bit, then I went, I taught elementary music, first and second grade, fourth and fifth grade, beginning band, and sixth and seventh grade chorus. Now I will tell you, that is the only time in my life that I stood on a piano bench and I yelled at children. Okay, that's the only time I did that. 
And I tell people, that prepared me for Marine Corps boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a lot of music teaching, you may get that job. So we have a very good, as far as it's competitive, as far as the pay and the longevity and the ability to stay. But, um, but, but that is a factor when we're talking about uh, music. But it is steady pay for steady work. And you also have to factor in full health and dental benefits. Mm -hmm. That is very big. So I'm not here recruiting per right, se, right. but I'm telling you what, this what is, this is part like. of a, what we, our, our package and what, what often is very competitive. When you look at how am I gonna get a job, you guys raise your hands in the beginning of class, how am I gonna get a job about the, uh, you know, to put bread on the table as a musician. I know we're out of time, but listen, if you want, I didn't have much to bring today, but I do have some marine pencils, you know Thank what I'm saying? You. I got some stickers for your little mute, you know what I'm talking about? Thank you If you want much. some of that, come on, you can do it. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. I also have a couple cards. If you want to talk to me, if I didn't answer any of your questions, I know the time is short. Please come talk to me, email me. I'll be happy to answer any question you might have about myself, our program, or any of the other uh, branches that, that uh, all of these. Thank you. Thank you very much.